Hello everyone, today we talk about the Italic reigns of Otto I and Otto II. In the past years I've made a couple of videos about Ottonian Italy. Um, last autumn we have seen Carolingian Italy, something more about the Italian 10th century, just a couple of weeks ago, about Hugh uh, of Provence slash Italy. And today we look in fact in some detail, at least, you know, for was paving the way for further detail in other future videos. In fact, um, the uh, the policy of Otto the First, Otto the Second, as one of the most uh, one of the periods of, of uh, if not actually the period of greatest um, stability as far as the German control of the peninsula in Holy Roman Imperial times was uh, concerned. You know that even under Otto the Third, and we made a video about him recently, mostly explaining the the Byzantine influence on the uh, Romano-Germanic imperial uh, ideology. Things got worse. The Ottonian Empire, fundamentally, also with uh, Henry the Second, the Bavarian branch, was not able to right, uh, just reconsolidate itself, both in Germany and in Italy. So that, as we will see now, much of the stability had itself had stemmed previously from a um let's say the 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 floating literally of this imperial power on such a huge territory that was fundamentally exiting a moment of great distress especially because of the magyar uh, invasions and thus that began to recover to work um to work well even just through imperial delegates that as we will see now and crucially enough and we explained this especially in the videos about the Ottonian so-called bishop counts was achieved uh, through the essentially the cooptation the appointment of confirmation of um, essentially of magnates that were already in power in the lands uh, that were conquered by the Ottonians Right, this this was crucial because naturally, um, all the crowns now that were uh, reunited by some degree, Germany, Italy, Burgundy were already, of course, ruled by um, not just uh, 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 just a nobility, a local nobility, as it had survived uh, in post Carolingian times, but also by some kind of royal authority. Sometimes even, namely, imperial one, because again, it just took to be crowned by the Pope in Rome, which was, as you understand, particularly easy for somebody ruling from Spoleto, for example, that would be co-opted by the same Ottonians later as a as a as a ruling uh, clan uh, in the in the area. Then, say somebody that had to first unify or at least gain the support of most of the. Eastern Frankish Kingdom had to cross the Alps, had to, in fact, be recognized by the same Italic subjects, um, and that had, in fact, to be crowned in Rome. All this in in a moment of, in fact, so-called Renovatio Imperi, in which um, the, the Ottonians were not alone, uh, in the sense that, uh, in doing, meaning that the, the Byzantine Empire was uh, re-expanding as well, it had an important foothold in southern Italy, and as we will see uh, now, the in fact the Ottonians and the Byzantines went at war. Right, they were at war for great part of um, these two Germanic uh, rulers' um, reign uh, for the control of the of the region. Uh, that was also infested by the Saracens, especially in the southwestern part, and that would have significant. Um, you know consequences also as far as properly the 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 destiny of the Ottonian dynasty was was concerned. There were lots of political actors, so naturally, today we stick mostly to imperial policy and royal policy, specifically of the Italic kingdom. Then we will see in another video, hopefully also a bit more in detail, what were the political territorial realities uh, of Italy. I plan to do the same thing for Germany. Uh, recently, we've also made videos about Burgundy. So again, everything is on the list, right? Uh, I plan to deal with in, in detail with with everything uh, as much as I can. Uh, 
uh, on this channel. Um, so, Ottonian Italy, as we've seen, is uh, a big deal historically because after the end of the Carolingian Empire, there hadn't quite been any other uh, Transalpine ruler who had descended uh, to Italy to seize the imperial crown in Rome. This was a big deal because uh, the Western and Eastern Frankish and the, the Burgundian rulers had maintained a substantial degree of power. They were the same lands from which originally the, the Franks had um, come to conquer the Longobard Kingdom, to which the imperial title had been attached. Right? It was not enough just to to go to Rome per se. You 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 must have acquired the Italic crown, the Iron Crown uh, of Lombardy to to claim you could even have the the power in the region to protect the papacy to be given the crown by not just the Pope but the Roman people and this as we will see was was also uh, an interesting um, feature that the Ottonians played on. Um, there had been as we've seen with Hugo of Provence recently of course some uh, Transalpine rulers that had interfered in the peninsula. The Italic rulers too had simply called them at some point when they weren't trying you know, a policy of, of power uh, themselves within the kingdom's boundary. But the, the the golden apple of Rome equated to the Italic kingdom as such, to which de facto since Car Charlemagne's and Louis the Pius times, the entire uh, imperial power d depended on, right? Uh, formally, internationally, um, publicly, also in the naturally in the kingdoms that you had been ruling uh, in the north, and um, it, it it's obvious that uh, after the Carolingian, say the the revival followed to to the defeat of the of the Magyar invasions, the kind of the the slowing down also the Norman and the Saracen ones. And we've seen it in many videos. Continental Europe would reactivate to a degree that could, in fact, simply uh, re reunite uh, the, uh, the the the, the post-Carolingian space. It was mostly a matter of who would have done that first. And uh, it may seem odd that it was the Saxons, the most uh, irreducible enemies of Charlemagne themselves, considered that the Ottonians didn't have any, mm, say. High background of any kind. The best they could boast was descending from the same Vidukind, right? That that had led the resistance against Charlemagne. So it, it, they were uh, paradoxically the actually one of the greatest success of uh, the Frankish Roman uh, achievements as far as properly the imperial conquest and the the evangelization were concerned. To not just, in fact, crush the Magyars uh, in Germany uh, through mostly a Saxon Franconian uh, base of power, so that summed up kind of the the warlike brutality of the Saxons with the uh, Frankish grandeur, in fact, of the Rhine mine area, um, uh, and uh, in fact, the most Frankish land uh, in in Germany. Uh, from which also the ancestral uh, people had uh, originated, but could, in fact, finally uh, gain enough consensus in Central Europe to cross the Alps and to reclaim the Italic and the Imperial crowns. The Western Franks were busy uh, trying to actually emerge from this pretty uh, kind of pumped up um, private dynasties that were very powerful on their own, but in this sense prevented an easy uh, re reconnection of power. Germany had it easier in a sense as far as still there was a sort of at least federal cooperation about this and, and the Ottonians would never factually control um, not even the, the majority of Germany directly, if we're not talking about Italy. The, the Burgundians were, um, were at this point declining as a power, at least were entering ever more in the eastern, in the orb within the orbit of the eastern Frankish one, and in fact would be united again together with Italy in, in what we call the Holy Roman Empire. It's just a 
um, a dissature, let's say, but it's the same, not just the same Carolingian Empire, but the same Roman Empire. And I explained countless times why I think so, because, you know, many people will tell you, no, it's not true, it's just the Byzantines, what you disgustingly call Byzantines still, because they were Romans, that were the only possible ones. Well, actually, the, the imperial concept is a much more transcendental um, one than it's the, the legalistic legitimism of Constantinople really claimed, and that not that they weren't Romans, it's just that they didn't have the, the universal empire, at least as far as someone else could rule over Rome herself, like in this case. We've made lots, I, I created a playlist about the Ottonians, you know, that this was uh, a moment of a radical. Um, um, you know, an escalatory resumption of uh, of the romant the concept of the romanity of the empire, right? The Ottonians switched properly from the empire of the Franks or, or the Saxons, as they could inspire nationally to be properly to call themselves Romans, nationally speaking, identically speaking, culturally speaking. The romanity of the empire had been boasted since Carolingian times, but it had not been fully associated properly to the ethnic recognition uh, of, of Romanity herself um, and uh, in part uh, this was uh, naturally a um, a tool that the Ottonians used to be recognized internationally but it, it was all one with the actual transcendental meaning of Romanity for what the Empire had previously achieved and that remained in the in the holiness of Rome of uh, the uh, you know, the, the unity, the ecumenic Catholic unity of, of, of Christendom, also because they had married into the Byzantines now, in relatively shady ways, because um, the legitimate emperors of Constantinople had never actually wanted to recognize, to, to, to provide with the, the Westerners with any um, uh, purple br uh, born um, bride, um, except uh, because of coups and also the desperation of emperors like John Semiscus to be recognized internationally as well. They, they made this kind of second great marriage, let's say, with Teofano and so on. But it, it was a big deal for the West because still, you know, it was factually at least uh, the, the current uh, imperial government of Constantinople to, to provide with this. It was, as we explained again, a huge, a massive, uh, a bulky Byzantine kind of imperial uh, kind of culture influence injected in in the Western Empire at, at this point, and more because again it's an incredibly complex uh, topic. Again, everything has its own video, um, but this is just to make you understand also better what what it meant for these rulers to resume Romanity and uh, the universality of the empire in, in the first place. Um, and uh, we have also explained elsewhere why, of course, their goal was to rule from Rome, not to rule from Germany or somewhere else, right? To, to create a centralized empire in, in the Mediterranean and in Europe that would be the same Roman one that technically had... Um, had always existed, right? Nobody really thought that the, the Roman Empire had fallen as such, right? Uh, the imperial one is, again, a transcendental uh, concept that uh, applies to any kind of of power that that, ha that point had been had become an hypothesis of the same Rome, and nobody really saw it in a different way um, within Christendom and within this um, ruling, in fact, uh, at this point, Germanic uh, peoples. Um, so Otto the First's concept of kingship uh, was deeply, probably soaked in a truly imperialistic ideology, right? He, the, 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 these concepts existed traditionally within those same, within the same Saxons, right before the Carolingian conquest and, and Christianization. To everyone in traditional cultures was clear what what the imperium was, uh, without even needing to explain it, and that's part of the reason why also you know they simply talked about it, and you know 
we say, okay, well, they call it empire more or less as we do, right? No, not as we do, because we don't do it the way they did anymore. Um, and it, it takes its own time to properly get what they were meaning through certain expressions um, uh, regarding it. Um, in any case, this had been proven uh, brutally with the Ottonian success against the Magyars that after generations of relative impunity uh, uh, of crossing basically all the post Carolingian kingdoms, raiding, plundering and causing significant damage especially to to the Eastern Frankish Kingdom were defeated at the Battle of the Lech uh, by Otto they had already been crushed at Riade under Otto's father Henry de Favler, 933. Uh, the unsung heroes of the situations are the, the Bavarians, at least the southeastern Germans, that were the ones that fought in kind of greater obscurity, if anything, because the Ottonian Saxon propaganda rose and then historiography rose to, again, uh, um, overbearing uh, uh, greatness after, especially. The, uh, the conquest of Italy and so on, but there had been a lot of attrition against the hungers um, on the eastern frontier as well. So I, I plan, by the way, to make uh, a series of videos about the eastern frontier of the eastern Frankish kingdom under Charlemagne, at least the Carolingians, um, Henry de Favre and Otto I, because uh, I already made a video on the importance of that frontier, but uh, it's often overlooked, and one also has to understand it the places, the politics, the, the people better. So we will hopefully cover that in our military history um, series. Uh, and uh, this imperialistic ideology was, however, also a necessity, as we just explained, to cope with the turbulent reality in which uh, the Ottonians had risen to power. As, as I was saying before, there was not quite... It, it's even hard to see properly such um, system as a true empire, at least as a, as a uh, national kind of um, ethnic uh, core land that manages to systematically subjugate any people around and to permanently occupy and and colonize and, and control, right? It was a, a very different thing. It was mostly, again, the recognition of an hegemonic preeminence of a given ruler that was very convenient for the lands involved here, especially considering that, again, these lands were so big that the, the ruler was constantly uh, itinerant uh, territorially, thus there was hardly, you know, the... Uh, the 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 annoyance of having to uh, to to cope with him permanently uh, in loco, right? And uh, Italy naturally was very advanced. Germany was also developing uh, importantly, and surely the Ottonian public uh, system was enhanced over this time, right? Most of what Germany would lose in terms of public authority, unfortunately for them, came especially with the investiture struggle. Uh, and uh, at this point, as we will see now, there, there was an important stability. And stability means consolidation. It means um, cooptation of elites. It means the creation of connections between, in this case, the, the two sides of the Alps. The naturally the influence that existed beyond the Elbe or beyond the the Rhone as well, right? So, um, and towards southern Italy, towards towards the, the Jutland Peninsula, right? So from the different directions from which this power emanated, right? And uh, cons most of this naturally stemmed from the, the power that the Ottonians had consolidated just in, in a typically German fashion from a private background. Henry the Fowler had been just like uh, the father of all the great... Uh, German emperors historically a great castle builder right this is the 10th centuries especially the, the century of encastellation not much for defensive purposes um, uh, towards some kind of foreign enemy rather for the consolidation of a massive landed asset locally 
right to rule over the, the people that inhabit there. Um, and the Saxons had their own military. Clientels were a rough people. They were quite warlike. They they were really you know if you study especially the campaigns on on the Slavic front, you realize that there is a that are, there is a level of uh, unspeakable brutality that, again, is one of the single most uh, fascinating chapters uh, in uh, high medieval military history. And again, I hope that we'll uh, you know, observe that more closely, because, again, there is a continuity historically in these lands that were also a, bit a hybrid between a, still a, a feudal and still a tribal world, and it would take centuries to to consolidate centers of that hammering, right, of Saxon steel, right, to, 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 and it, this is fascinating, because it, it's still the Viking era, and you find some of the most important um, finds, right, from, you know, scattered a bit everywhere in the north, actually of German blades, Frankish blades, as they were historically coming mostly from the Rhineland at that point, since, uh, since the migration era, and there is all, um, mill Tarai's cultural background that of course had made the Saxons emerging as the leaders and the um, in some ways the refounders at least for how we have conceptualized it historiographically of, of, of the empire what we call the Holy Roman Empire um, naturally the internal situations were however somehow turbulent right uh, these regions ruled by the Ottonians were never fully at peace we have seen um, the case in videos like Alamannian Alpine Re uh, Russia uh, we have seen it in some stories let's say of the also in the historical region um, series all right especially the, the ones in Germany how gradually with great effort and with rebellions that involved even for example Otto's mm, son in, in Swabia right um, how the how a, at least an hegemonic ruler could be recognized by the majority of the uh, the Eastern Frankish princes or at least the the decisive um, uh, the, the majority of the the moral force of, of the kingdom as such, and there was always an incredible negotiation and effort and strain behind uh, the ability of keeping everything together. Uh, Otto was crowned king of Italy in his first expedition uh, to the south of the Alps in 951, and emperor considered that the term Holy Roman W was not there, it would c come centuries later fully, so, but still emperor, right, the whole Roman emperor in 962. Um, however, Otto's sovereignty de facto was um, not uh, recognized, um, uh, at least fully accepted in, in the Italic kingdom as a whole in, until um, after 966. Um, in fact, um, first of all, we should focus on what, what it meant to write properly to carry out a campaign south of the Alps. Still, most of these interventions were ad hoc, aimed at the crowning or solving a specific dispute along the way. Eventually, these rulers came back to, to Central Europe to, to cope also there with the problems that existed. Um, in any case, um, this is typical of the Tonian Ottonian rule, right, as, as such. Uh, Otto I only succeeded in consolidating his rule by essentially paying more attention to the power of the local magnates. There was really no way by the mid of the 10th century to carry out, like, as we were saying before, a, a, an imperial conquest and properly occupation and direct control of a country with the demographic and agricultural resources like Italy, right? The level of development, the urbanization, the fortification, um, and, and so on, right? So the it, it's only in this light that we should consider, for example, certain attritions that existed even with local magnates um, uh, and the way they, they solved themselves. For example, 
uh, consider that many subjects at this point were also participating to things like the German diets across the Alps and so on. At a point, Otto I had to exile, uh, uh, among the others, the Bishop uh, uh, Sigulf of Piacenza, uh, uh, Vido of Modena, uh, who would be essentially pardoned uh, eventually. These were, again, powerful uh, prelates of some of the most important cities of the Italic Kingdom that especially uh, controlled the, the Apenninic passages that were needed by uh, the, the Imperial Army to cross into central Italy towards Rome, and as we will see now, what, what important interest in the south to contend to, to the Byzantines. Um, the, uh, the 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 latter vid of Modena, for example, was would be replaced later by uh, the Bishop Humbert of Parma, and again here we we see the the Emilian stripe of cities. Just um, recently made a video about medieval Parma that, that covers this period. We have to finish with the late Middle Ages, um, and we've seen how crucial these um, Roman cities historically were, not just for the for the traffics along the, the, the Emilia Road, but again, the Apenninic passes uh, especially. Um, and the advantage of, of bishops naturally was that they didn't have a dynastic power, uh, they were elected by the local church, and you could thus replace them more easily. Humbert of Parma would go as far as becoming arch-chancellor of the Italic kingdom. Um, and so the, the most important uh, administrative figure in practice uh, after uh, royal power uh, himself. And this was a way, um, in general, in which families which had traditionally held public office, so we're talking about the lay, uh, say, dynasties that existed since Carolingian times and were mixed, so with the previous uh, the previous Longbert um, uh, aristocracy um, had um, had played a, you know that had would keep playing a role in the administration of Ottonian Italy. It's the case of the Suponids, for example, that were ruling from the quite strategic Duchy of Spoleto that, as you know, constituted. Um, the southernmost part of the empire, at least what was technically directly controlled by lay power, as in the midst you already had the, the papal states or, that technically did not belong to the empire because it, they didn't belong but to God, so they weren't even properly to, con to be considered a, as an earthly reality, if not by some nature of lay power that the emperors tried to, 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 to boost within the, the same territory. Uh, the Suponids were known since at least at the time of Louis the Pius, they were of Salian or perhaps um, so Franconian or perhaps Alamannian origin. Uh, again, they had been installed there as, as local dukes. In this case, at least the Franks had mostly counts, but uh, here uh, the duchies were the kind of the standard um, Longobard districtuation of the uh, of the country. Um, and uh, this this situation remained unchanged since the ninth century. Consider this: that even just in a biological, genealogical sense, that I don't know Otto the first father Henry the Fowler, that we normally think of like you know th this is the first true new ruler that, as you know, wouldn't become emperor but was offered the opportunity right to and still emerged as a, a true ruler in, in Germany was born when? On July the 7th, 876. That is to say, the Carolingian Empire would end when he was 12. Just think of how deeply seated this sense that there had been an imperial grandeur, that there had been an empire. It was just, you know, uh, close in time to these people, right? Uh, Adelaide of Italy, uh, Otto's wife, father, was uh, Rudolf II of Burgundy, he was he was born in 880, right? So in the same way, and those were descending, if I'm not wrong, you know, where or another, um, from from the same Carolingians, right? 
uh, which was a big deal also, of, in fact, for the marriage between Otto and Adelaide, because, again, that finally brought some kind of Carolingian blood in the Ottonian line um, to boost that kind of imperial prestige, right? But these were all people that had been part of that war, had known what the, the imperial rule had been about, and so it's as if, you know, that the war that had never ended, again, the empire had never ended in the first place for anyone in the centuries. Right, um, and it's also fascinating to think, after all, the the properly the, the connections that had always existed historically throughout all these Romano-Germanic kingdoms, even before Carolingian times, which we tend to uh, underestimate. I mean, the 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 Western courts from Britain to Italy, from uh, you know mostly again there were the bigger Franks in between, but even with the Visigoths when they still existed as a as a late as a kingdom, uh, were all in contact with each other. They exchanged each other, they, uh, they adopted each other's children, they, they fostered them at, at, uh, you know, in, in, the, in each other's courts. Um, there was a strong connection, we're not talking about the church, naturally, that supervised over all this. So, the idea of a disintegrated uh, post-Roman early medieval Western Europe is just like a, 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 a dramatistic kind of of take on a reality that historically never existed. And this is not to deny, of course, that the, the titanic success of the Carolingian Empire in at least leaving a, something like a standardized script, a common um, connective tissue, let's say, of fabric of of culture through monasteries, through the, in fact, the involvement of, as it happened, as you understand also in Ottonian times, of the involvement of the bishops in public administration, which, especially in such uh, an urbanized, you know, and in fact, city ruled uh, country like Italy, which was not the case, for example, in Germany, like, you know, um, here you had to, con you had to control if you wanted to control the entire country as such. Right, um, so it was crucial, right, since uh, the the beginning of Carolingian rule in Italy, on the wake of what the Longobards had always done to rule from the city, to have a, a, a literate administration, um, at least in also as far as the local rulers were concerned. So that's also why the bishops worked pretty well because they, again, they could be, they were not dynasts, they could be. Installed or removed, depending on the situation, at least by some degree, because they were still coming from the lay power families. But the latter, as the the lay original lay nobility, could be thus at least more contained in kind of private, um, privatistic, decentralizing ambitions. Right? Italy had since longer times had had this advantage that. Mm, the, the the wealth was much better distributed. It wasn't the 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 there was there wasn't the overwhelming sparkuation of the north where very few people owned all the land. So at best the local dukes and and gastels would just compete within the same public administration, right? Not to create a, a, a huge power on their own that would go against the king. In fact, um, the Longobard kingdom was dramatically united, and there is a reason why the, the Carolingians chose that for properly detaining the, at least being connected, with being the, the prerequisite for obtaining an imperial crown, and also why the Carolingians maintained as the only kingdom that they they conquered as such, with Charlemagne himself becoming king of the Franks and all, on, of the Longobards on the same level, right, which never happened with the Burgundians, with the Alamanni, with anyone else, right. This is crucial. Um, naturally, there were some lay uh, uh, dynasties that had traditionally been I remember, uh, in Italy among the, the various ones that had existed, the various counts, etc., such as the uh, the Arduinics, the Alleramics. These were especially northwestern Italy in the area of Piedmont, right, also controlling the passes with Burgundy, right. Um, they had received a uh, pretty good treatment by by the Ottonians. Otto I also accelerated the progress of several careers, for example, that of the Canossa, that again co controlled uh, importantly passes between the Po Valley and Tuscany on the Apennines. Um, 
and um, there was there had been uh, about this, however, a political factor as Alberto out of of Canossa had essentially um, uh, won the gratitude of Adelaide of Italy as she had escaped the rule of the uh, the, the prisony uh, of the Vrans that had essentially again kidnapped her and also locked her in, in an island on the Como Lake in the north uh, giving her even a few amount of food and said she managed to escape Adalbert out of Canossa um, uh, protected her um, and uh, hosted her in the in fact the castle of Canossa this um, at the time impregnable f- fortress dominating between Tuscany and the, the modern area um, and this was when when Otto the first because that's the the place from which Adelaide called Otto to save her and this brought to the marriage between the two the Canossa were rewarded greatly for for the service right and this uh, stand that uh, you know they they had courageously taken as marquises of of, of Tuscany against Berengar the second of Ivrea after that Adelaide uh, husband the, the 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 previous one uh, King Lothar the second of Italy had uh, died. Uh, also, here notice the Burgundian connection that had uh, existed um, among these families. We've seen it also with Hugo of Provence, the, the various interference between the Upper Burgundy and, and the, the era of Arles, and the, the various political factions that this had triggered in the um, among the same it- Italic subjects. Um, Otto had. Uh, Otto the first had already unified the duke domes and bishoprics of Germany, and he now applied the same successful techniques to Italy. Right. Um, th- this was very important administratively, especially in a country like Germany that in in the northeastern frontier had yet to be properly stabilized, ur- or urbanized. I mean, the foundation of archbishoprics. You know that at some point. At the end of the 9th century, the Vikings had destroyed Hamburg and they had to rebuild it. You know, um, the, the, the Etonians came exactly from that frontier, as you understand, uh, in Saxony. Um, Otto ruled mostly from Magdeburg. So um, they, they had seen properly the, the, the harshest picture, the cost, what it took again to expand Christendom and a territorial control. Um, uh, in those areas, and they had succeeded uh, in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom to this. So in Italy, it was even easier because of the aforementioned, uh, especially overlapping of the fact that the, the 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 country was already ruled from the cities historically. Um, so the status of the officials in closest contact with the um, Ottonian administration was enhanced. For example. On February the 13th, 962, Otto I decreed that a pope could not be elected in the absence of imperial envoys. This was a precaution already taken uh, since the time of Louis the Pius, who was a Frankish emissary constantly living uh, in in Rome at the papal court. Um, however, the prerogative of uh, of this ambassador to even because he technically had to express uh, an opinion regarding the election there was a very political thing and connected with the Roman aristocracy etc now it was properly defined as you know you literally cannot be elected as a pope by the Roman people by the Roman church um, if there is not an imperial envoy there and naturally with an enhanced control on the same election right the support of the bishops possessing temporal powers was obtained between 962 and 965 Otto the first issued a diplomata to the bishops of Parma Reggio Modena and Asti again strategic locations because uh, Parma, Reggio, and Modena, as we've seen before, also Piacenza are all the Emilian stripe, 
so they connect essentially Lombardy, the areas of um, of Pavia of Milan, uh, to Ravenna, to the essentially the papal states. Uh, that at the time, by the way, are also Ravenna is also a bit of an autonomous archbishopric that competes with Rome by degree, so that was also instrumental. They also run the the Emilia Way runs uh, across the 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 right bank of of the Po, and on the right of it you have the Apennines. So this these cities all control those passes, as we were saying before. Asti is in the northwest, and it's so controls also an area that is a bit more rural, a bit more feudal, and that thus can be more easily controlled if you increase the importance of a city, like us, it was technically the most important one at that point, or at least was becoming. I, I made, by the way, a video uh, especially about Asti and Aquileia during the 10th and 11th century um, that shows you the degree of power that the local bishops achieved exactly um, in, in Ottonian times, right? In incredible degrees of public authority that ha had to, in theory, help the imperial control of uh, on, on these lands. Eventually, you know, this brought actually to a further autonomization. Not, not much because of it. Actually, it was a, a clever move. Just imperial events would also take other turns in the broader empire. Uh, in the first place, um, but these diplomata naturally sanctioned those rights by again the the action of a renewed public authority of the degree of of the Ottonians that had again that were ruling over Germany, Italy, and Burgundy altogether. So much more powerful than what these areas had, and most of Europe had seen essentially for. Uh, Almost for for centuries now, right since plus the decline of the Carolingians, equal attention was paid uh, by Otto to ensure that there was uh, an efficient county district uh, functionality in this Holic Kingdom. You know that uh, as we were saying before the. Basically, the, the Carolingian Empire was districtuated on the basis mostly of cities still, so this overlapped with the diocese in, um, in, in counties, in, in the comitatus, right? Um, which also explains a bit the, the, the thing of the Missi Dominici, that is to say, um, you have a count and a bishop that rule from the same district, because there is a lay public district and then an ecclesiastical um, one, that are cooperating, right? And the lay guy naturally has the control over, he can sentence people to death, which the, the clergy cannot do. They can exercise this kind of upper, higher justice, let's say, and uh, the clergy has to take care of the cure of, of the souls. The empire and the papacy were considered hierarchical, a bit in the same way. Um, and the districts were, were quite important um, because they... Uh, for for this reason, embodied the functionality properly of public government. In m north of the Alps, let's say that many we've seen it in some historical regions, serious, for example, one of Burgundy, etc. The, the this districts had gone had been modified. Um, the public authority had also de facto accepted this, and this had come for dynastic reasons. For again, for the fact that um, north of the Alps, also the city structure had somehow loosened uh, after the, the Roman Empire more than in the south. In, in Italy, instead, you had still properly, till actually to, till this very day, that the modern Italian provinces are still basically the same um, districts that existed from, from Roman times and throughout this period with the counties, the, the duchies sometimes. Um, and that, um, that worked quite well. And there were many, by the way, because... Again, there were many different cities that you could thus be imagine all, all orderly and fragmented, so enriched. So we were a better target for an imperial policy, right, to, to manage, especially through the bishops, and that's why all these diplomata to the bishops, because again, they were easier to handle then than some feudal lord entrenched somewhere like 
you know, in Germany, where you had literally to, to go to this lodge to using massive military power to, to in, in the forests, in the swamps, in, in the castles scattered all over the, this, without a center, right? And th this difference would remain historically for, for quite a long time. We've seen it in many videos also about the uh, German feuds between bishop and count, this kind of things, because um, there was a much less ordered public destructuation and, and administration and power in the first place um, in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom. Otto I created new counts whose families in their turn eventually began to show an interest in episcopal careers. Uh, this was normal, given the increasing importance of cities um, in these generations. We will see it in some other video. Hopefully there is a great deal of urbanization of also the traditional rural uh, aristocracy. Um, and again, these families are more like clans, uh, so that there is still a kind of a horizontal um, you know, connection that could bring one person to be a bishop, the other to be to be a knight, let's say, um, in a slightly improper way, yet still maintaining a status, right? Being part of that net, of being the kind of elite, right? That's also how the communes would be born in the following century um, uh, and more. Uh, in any case, um, it's obvious that whenever a, a nobiliar client was feeling threatened some sort, he would try to counter politically um, the, the public authority by becoming public authority itself, playing with the same cards, being co-opted, cooperating at the same time, substantiating some still power on their own from their assets that they already had. Um, again, these people could not simply be dislodged, could not be destroyed, could not be... I mean, you would have taken a major um, campaign, right? It would have essentially triggered all the other nobility by saying, you know, if these gets eradicated, we also have to take up arms. There was still, generally speaking, in the Italic Kingdom, and this was true also in Germany, this idea that, again, these this kings and emperors were there just because they were now, like, useful um, to maintain order, to, generally speaking, make things flow without too many, um, you know, problems, right? And to expand also the frontiers where war could could be done instead, you know, uh, you know, too many concerns except perhaps maybe for for the military costs of that from the from whoever was was providing uh, the resources for it, um, and and going for that. That's what also the Ottonians, in fact, began to 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 do. Right, not much campaigning, not fighting amongst the, the same within against the same communities that were supporting them in, in the kingdom, but beyond its boundaries. Uh, in general, Otto I thus create, uh, re recruited new members of the nobility from among the local families. Right? He, he could not do otherwise. Unlike Widow and Hugh um, of, of Provence, who had imported their followers from Burgundy, and again, I made a video just about the the Italic opposition to that, uh, right, in the fact that ultimately Hugh was expelled together with his with his Burgundians um, by the the Italic aristocracy. Um, so Burgundy and Provence, the, depending on, but you know he uh, Otto the first instead did not completely transform the composition of the establishment, right. Uh, there were uh, some Germans, of course, uh, appointed as bishops as popes as well. This thing would, would go on, and it, it would create attrition, right, also further on, on under Otto III. Generally speaking, though, it was a matter of co-opting the elites. The best way you can hope to, not to have maybe a, a strong direct control in the land, but still receiving its support, not having trouble with it, not having to spend unnecessary resources to, um, to find, to, to, to erode your own, once, uh, as opposed to the ones you can simply be given by the same people. Um, and Otto's reign immediately distinguished itself by the interest shown in Rome and in central and southern Italy. 
Otto did not limit his sphere of actions to the area bounded by the Po Valley and the Apennines that had been essentially the, 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 the Longobard, the Carolingian um, base, right, as the of, of the kingdom. Uh, but he um, decided at least to counter the papacy as much as at least the the possibility of appointing a loyal pope was concerned, so reviving the idea that the Caesar or papistic Byzantine idea that that you could fundamentally just depose uh, any bishop, including the Roman one, as it, it would please you, except this was a bit more of a complicated thing because Rome was still a larger city in the West, had a strong Western, uh, at least in Western Christendom, it has a strong uh, aristocracy that, generally speaking, had also many connections with the Byzantines, so it was uh, it was more difficult than ruling over Lombardy or, or Tuscany, right? Um, so this uh, would underpin basically the entire concept of the, the apparition of the church that is paradoxically the same one that would be used by the Gregorian reforms to stop the lane so imperial interference in the papal appointment in the 11th century that would backfire uh, for for the emperors. Um, as they were naturally stressing this very high kind of absolute imperial uh, ideas, uh, ideals of ecumenic power, complete uh, uh, control, right? At least as far as, as the, the spiritual matter had never been quite resolved uh, de facto. The Carolingians had enjoyed a great uh, ascendance on the papacy, had de facto controlled Rome. However, the thing had also lasted um, r relatively few, and uh, the Roman papacy had been acquiring constantly much greater autonomy uh, since, um, you know, since, since the very beginning, because it was still in, on, on the southern frontier of the empire. It was, again, uh, kind of a proxy area as far as also Byzantine interference was was concerned, and more at least for this constant necessity of the uh, of of, uh, of the papacy to remain autonomous and still having, a, in fact, a power over the uh, the imperial crowning. So in order to do that, you you had to at least have a a, a pope elected um, that even if appointed, but you had had to be properly put in place. And this could take time, and it involved controlling properly the city, which was, as we've seen, complicated, uh, etc. Um, Otto I opposed Popes John XII and Benedict V, and arranged the election of Leo VIII, so he's his own guy, let's say. Uh, peace was reached after, only, however, after the death of, of the latter, uh, with the election in 965, that was carried out, interestingly enough, against the wishes of the people of Rome. The people of Rome, properly the Romans, were the ones that had to sanction the imperial election um, in, in St. Peter. Right after the emperor was crowned, they had to, to, to declare that he was the emperor of, of the Romans, because without the Romans... And in this sense, meant literally as the aristocracy of the city of Rome, you couldn't formally have that crowning. So that was the political thermometer of the herbs of the eternal city. Um, on that occasion, however, Otto had managed, also with, with his um, military force, to appoint the, the bishop of Narni, uh, who assumed the title of John the Thirteenth. The Prince of Capua, so th these were the southern Longobards that had remained technically out of the empire, but were always some kind of in between the Byzantines and, 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 the, and the Ottonians at this point. Uh, um, that um, was named Pandolf, um, had um, offered of hospitality previously to Laudiate, so as we've seen, uh, one of Otto's supporters, who had fled to him. And for this reason, Otto rewarded the Prince of Capua by conferring him a hell of a power, 
technically the properly the march of Spoleto and Camerino in in, in central Italy on the Adriatic, uh, and uh, as a result was accepted into the highest levels of the government in the Italic Kingdom. This aspect is quite important because, as we will see now, the southern Longobards had, as you know, survived practically the the original uh, kingdom, and albeit the the Carolingians um, had waged some campaigns to kind of reduce them to um, to obedience, uh, they had never been permanently directly occupied right directly conquered and they they played this they they were entrenched mostly in Benevento so we were talking about an Apenninic hinterland that is quite difficult to control um, and it's quite eloquent now that the the Ottonian power was so strong that could be extended as far as Capua that is just in companion in in, in the south of Rome but normally out of the reach of uh, imperial forces historically. And even more, however, that in order to win this guy's loyalty, Otto had to confer him, uh, confer him the title of Marcion of Spoleto and Camerino, that were actually a, a pretty big chunk of Italy, uh, provided also with a with a significant strategic relevance because they control an important degree of the Apenninic passes, especially the ones that led in the south towards Rome herself, because they were pretty close to it. Um, and generally speaking, lots of resources. And naturally, Pandolf of Capua, as we've seen, accepted. Um, and yet, this, this equated still to that, an admission that in order to maintain a control also as far as Campania, just parts of the, the southern, of the so-called Langobardia Minor, that the Maior was technically the same Italic kingdom in the north, um, there had to be such um, such uh, recognition. Again, so you understand that in Ottonian government, you have just the recognition, right, the formal recognition of powers that de facto already existed locally and that were maintained by the Germanic rulers. In 967, Otto I raised his son, Otto II, to the position of co-emperor. Uh, so the fact of creating a, a dynasty, even though the, the German uh, the, the German kingship was was elective, it would remain that, but that this could be afforded at this point and began negotiations to obtain the hand of the Byzantine princess Stefano for, for his son. Despite the negotiations between Constantinople and Saxony, there was still a certain amount of tension between them for the aforementioned renewed royal and imperial interest um, shown by Otto I in southern Italy, which technically had never been part of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, there was some ambiguity there legally, however, because the southern Longobards had been part of the Longobard kingdom, and contrarily to, to opinion, had never actually rebelled to Pavia. Um, and uh, this entailed, at least given the ethnic uh, continuity from the north to, to, to the south, these uh, southern um, duchies that, in the meanwhile, was actually technically the Duchy of Benevent that had fragmented, as we've seen in, in other, in the smaller parts, but they were still part of that kind of Longobard legacy, uh, could be reintegrated legitimately in the Italic kingdom. We have seen in the video about the Carolingian domination of Italy that it had been the Franks who changed the name from Longobard to Italic kingdom to stress the fact that, yeah, this is Italy now. Uh, the Longobards had already identified themselves with Italy quite eloquently. There were some titles properly, you know, whatever king uh, properly Rex Totius Italius of king of the entire Italy, which is something that the Longobards cared very much about because they, they had to constantly wrestle 
even though they had the upper hand and they were about to finish the job before the Carolingians arrived, uh, the, the peninsula from, from, from the Byzantines that still maintain a presence and still to, to that point, as you understand. Um, so, but since Longobard sounded too national as a character, uh, the Carolingians wanted to stress, like, let's change name because it doesn't sound like, you know, there is a Longobard revanchism burning under the ashes. Um, and technically, that same Italic kingdom was the one in which the, the Longobards had fit before, because it was the same Longobard one. And again, nobody in the South had ever said it does not exist. There is a huge mythology that has been brutally debunked by historiography from, from multiple generations and people still believe in, that is to say that the Longobard Kingdom was allegedly split, divided. It's against any kind of evidence. Um, I studied Longobard history for years, and I've always been surprised how, you know, historiography can say out loud pretty clearly all the story, and people keep thinking, is that true, you know, the historiography of 200 years ago without having ever read or known the story. That is the sources, that is the entire history and the microscopic evidence of this. But again, we still live in a world that uh, basically is just, you know, wishfully pretending to, to have any historical awareness um, to this point, and not just because of our fortunate historiographical advancement, just by by attitude. Um, so, as we've seen, um, southern Italy was a complicated area, because there, there was uh, essentially the, the interland, the, the majority of the population was Longobard, right, was still kind of Italic, broadly meant to say this because um, the, the, the schism, there, there had been the, fo the, the issues with Fotius, right, but the, the schism between the East and West would, would occur just uh, in the following century, however there was already a difference between, say, the Greek church by a degree, and so mostly the coastal areas of the Byzantine held cities that had always been very very much Greek influenced um, if not properly Greek speaking, right? And this uh, longer bird, Italic interland. Um, plus, there were the Saracens that had, at, at this point, actually been dislodged. They had never made much of a headway into into mainland Italy. They had mostly contented themselves with controlling some some um, uh, some uh, uh, ring forts, and very much like the Vikings, except they they didn't colonize the demographic and carrying out their piracy stuff, right? And this was true mostly for southern Italy. At the beginning of the century, the, there had been a significant al alliance of the Italic Kingdom, the Byzantines, the Papacy, to dislodge them from the mouth of the Garigliano River. There had been an incredible success, especially for Rome and her countryside. Um, at this point, it, it had been mostly the Longobards that had called in the Saracens to, to piss off the Byzantines, because very often that's the point. The, the, the so-called second invasions, the Normans, the Magyars, the Saracens, we think, oh my god, this avalanche of peoples coming from nowhere. It was just pirates, uh, raiders, right? They weren't anything like kind of uh, politically or territorially threatening as far as, you know, the, their individual capacities were. If, if they made any headway, it was mostly because the continental Europeans were allowing them to do so expressly to counter central power as it's widely evident in fact in southern Italy even in in, in Germany with with the Magyars especially until things began to be very um, uh, very messed up to the point that okay let's simply dislodge them right as seen in Gaul also with the base of, of Fraxinetum in part with the same Viking raids that at a certain point stopped, they concentrate mostly just in, in the North Sea, in Britain, in Ireland and, and elsewhere, but they they, they weren't to make major territorial acquisitions uh, without even just even the permission of the local uh, rulers. Um, so, um, uh, um, Otto the First was represented in southern Italy, as we've seen by that point, by Pandolf of Capua. Um, and this allowed the Imperials to carry out military expeditions uh, to Capua at some point, Benevent, 
and even Apulia. Um, Benevent being the most important longer bird center, Apulia being mostly like a frontier area between that and the Byzantines, but significantly mostly threatening for the latter because um, objectively nobody had gone that far. I guess the, the Carolingians had managed to dislodge the um, the the Saracens from Bari at a point um, because uh, Taranto and Bari had been occupied by the 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 Saracen pirates they had founded an emirate with the blessing of the Caliphate of Cordoba there Taranto had been freed by would be freed later by the Byzantines but originally uh, the emperor the, the emperor Louis the second that was king of Italy because that's what the partition had brought the empire right ruling from the Italic kingdom um, uh, when the empire was still standing had managed to free Bari which was, again was a Greek city which uh, was a huge deal because it showed to the locals that the Franks were stronger there now than the Byzantines had been. So this renewed interest in southern Italy, and literally the you know going boots on the ground there by, by the Ottonians, triggered the Byzantines dramatically, and open warfare uh, flared practically. Um, these are the years of the famous expedition, uh, the famous embassy of Lutprand, the bishop of Cremona, as imperial, in fact, um, amb ambassador to the court of um, of Constantinople. That uh, brought this, this, to some works about it, to some interest, uh, ethnographic insight from the West about the Byzantine world, and so on. And even though this mission was celebrated by such events, um, this could be carried out only during an interlude of peace between the Byzantines and the Ottonians, um, which, in fact, if you read the Antipodosis um, and the, the other work that, that describes this, this, this embassy, you, know, you realize there is a lot of uh, acrimony stemming from between the Byzantines and the Longbirds. There are some dialogues that surely never happened uh, at the court because otherwise Lutbrand would have been immediately put to death considering the Byzantine uh, etiquette. Uh, but that reveals how much the two parties actually hated each other. So this is also the reason why the marriage of Otto II and uh, the, the Byzantine Emperor Stefano was not celebrated until 972 when a more durable peace had been established between um, the, um, the 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 at the time of Lutbrand was Nicephorus uh, focus at this point it was it was the new emperor John Simiscus that was the one who carried out the the, the marriage broker the marriage deal because it was a way just to 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 reinforce himself in in that position where as you know this is this is a Ma the Macedonian period but there have been some uh, there were several usurpers that um, uh, remain in parallel with the Macedonian blood. It, as you know, the, there is the Byzantine history playlist, and there is pl plenty of the stuff here. We'll cover everything in detail, as we partly already did. In 972, Otto I left Italy for Germany uh, forever, because he died the following year in May at the monastery of Memleben, so the end of this great historical figure, um, and throughout um, his reign, he had, as we've seen, maintained a constant flow of diplomas to churches and followers, had been meeting a lot with the Italic Proceres, so counts and bishops in the full wake of, of the Carolingian tradition, uh, who had thus been empowered to carry out new legal and administrative business uh, of um, of the land, uh, so that on Otto's departure, Italy was, after all, enjoying a period of, of relative stability, right? There wasn't any major war going on, there wasn't any disruptive, um, you know, issue, just per se, normal competition, conflict, but nothing 
you know, that would actually set the basis for the disgregation of this order. And this is the reason why um, in the seven years following um, Otto's death, Italy found itself in such a strange situation for the Middle Ages of being without a king, and without an emperor, by the way, but having no new pretender to the crown. At the end of the 11th century, the Italic aristocracy would fight against the Ottonians to elect actually a king of Italy, and hopefully a whole, in this sense, an Italian Holy Roman Emperor on their own, and as you know, they were defeated. Um, and after that, the communes take over, there was the, the, the Gregorian form, so things changed. Uh, uh, the Germans would never intervene. In fact, so they would never stay in Italy as much as the, the Ottonians had managed to achieve in, in a time in which generally speaking the, the political institu the, the, yeah I mean the political institutional structures were weaker yet that actually is a, is a pretty good indicator of the fact that there was more consensus regarding that presence in the 10th century that would be in the 11th or, or less in the 12th or the 13th um, it was therefore to the imperial legates who dealt with serious disturbances in Rome fomented by Theodorus' nephew's um, uh, Theodorus' nephew Crescentius and with the pardoning of all the opponents of the regime such as the Lombard. In other words, though all those noblemen that had been invested by all these public offices kept ruling the land as they had always done thus this brought to further stability because they were the same people that had existed from before that had also benefited uh, from this uh, regime to strengthen their, their own power. A uh, bit of a traditional way that, as we've seen, but the rise of the communes in the, in the following centuries would actually evaporate as such, um, but that at this point were, were quite functional. Again, the main problems had uh, come from Rome because the Roman nobility uh, uh, led by Crescentius, yeah, descended from. We don't know whether it was Theodore II's son, uh, or uh, the historians are not sure about the genealogies, because unfortunately, again, these were still kind of somewhat horizontal clients by a degree, and so we don't have the the necessarily clarity about the dynastic descendants. But um, these were the the Roman noblemen that had somehow controlled for for generations the papal elections and hadn't liked at all that the Ottonians had uh, stepped in, in Rome and kind of uh, uh, interfering with the system and there had been major agitations so the, the things continued because naturally there was an imperial presence there some officials some parties that supported still the, the Ottonian um, dynasty and so on as always Rome was, was split in that regard um, there weren't also many problems with previous uh, competitors of the Ottonians, such as the Palatine Count Bernard, who ruled from from Lombardy, from from Milan. Uh, uh, that was the only city which, at this point, given you know her rapid growth, was kind of causing also more problems within the Italic Kingdom, as it would do later against Barbarossa, for example. Uh, and uh, and that um, you know at this point, however, still somehow cooperated again because nobody was against the the concept of of an imperial rule. It's just uh, how much they they could um, broker, let's say, in this in this bargain that that really matter at the end of the day. So, in, in other words, the Ottonian experiment worked successfully. They understood not to go too heavy on the Italic um, subjects, and they made things work uh, on a on a good kind of orderly path. Like the 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 the, the kingdom was already somehow set to, to evolve in a civile, literate, urban uh, dimension. Uh, speaking of Otto the Second, so here we skip the. The, the stories we, we just treat with, uh, what um, w what interests us uh, regarding the Italic affairs um, would um, 
personally be involved in fact uh, in, 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 in these ones at the end of 980 uh, after he had quashed a certain amount of uh, opposition in Germany because there naturally there were actually even greater problems um, and there were still hot frontiers and unloyal um, subjects uh, and at this point Otto had also somehow solved some problems regarding the relation with his mother because the two actually hated each other so much so that at a point Adelaide had to take a refuge to the court of her brother Conrad, a king of Burgundy. And uh, on reaching Italy, Otto II discovered that the imperial legates had, again, been doing a pretty good job by themselves. Um, he was also pretty pleased and somehow lucky to discover that the current pope, Benedict the Seventh was one of his supporters because, again, now we're skipping this, but there is all an international dimension here that it's not just this this local kingdoms that matters, right? That there were deep connections again between the Eastern, the Frankish, the the Italic kingdoms, the the one, of the Western Franks of Burgundy. So there were lots of things constantly going on. It's an incredibly complicated topic, so we will hopefully treated in, in a video, in this case about papal policy um, not his own, but again, there was an important papal autonomy still uh, at this point. Otto II uh, himself dealt with the Milanese unrest, which as we just said, was to procure the social and political upheavals that characterize, would characterize Lombardy between the 10th and 11th century, uh, the pateria that was also um, exploited by the papacy during the Gregorian reforms. Um, these were kind of some movements against the imperial legates um, led by some kind of Lombard elite that was supporting some kind of um, popular movement, also some kind of... Um, heretical sects. Uh, the thing was eventually quelled after a while, but still with, you know, the uh, the rise of the commune and not much of the imperial legates that were becoming ever less uh, relevant at that point. Otto could mostly discuss the broader situation of Italy in a more tranquil atmosphere, such as the one of Ravenna and Rome, after all, at least there were, as we've seen, some problems also there, but the major issues had happened in, in Milan. Uh, at this point, Gerbert of Aurillac, future Pope Sylvester II, the preceptor of Otto III, uh, a gigantic figure in the High Middle Ages, uh, properly re-giving an, an imperial mindset to the papacy, being a, a person of extreme culture. You know, he was essentially a a Visigoth from Auvergne who had an enormous culture and was um, would become Archbishop of Rem and then Pope. At this point, he had been appointed, in fact, by Otto II as the abbot of Bobbio, that was the famous monastic foundation of St. Columbanus uh, from the time of uh, the Longobard kings Agilulf and Theodolinda. So all very prestigious posts... Um, and very high-profile characters such as Gerbert that had a direct, again, uh, essentially work as a as a counselor for, for, for the emperor, right, on the broader international affairs. Um, and it was decided that the uh, best policy and strategy to pursue at, at this point, given the fundamental stability of the Italic kingdom, was to resume uh, military campaigns in southern Italy. So agreements were easily concluded with the southern Longbirds of Benevent and Naples that 
at this point realized how powerful the Ottonians were. They didn't want to put themselves against them. So they knew that in spite of whichever the success of these of these campaigns, still um, Benevent and Naples would have enjoyed some kind of decentralized position uh, in the empire, um, which brought to the imperial army um, easily uh, uh, overcoming uh, the obstacles between them and Apulia and Calabria that were respectively occupied um, between 981 and 982. However, and this was a major turning point in the history of the empire because uh, it was really a disaster, famously enough, that, uh, that when Otto II, July 982, despite of the arrival of, of a strong military aid from Germany uh, that counted some of the highest nobility, had his army literally slaughtered by the Muslims in a battle south of Cotrone Cape Colonna, uh, in Calabria, this battle was a, was a bloodbath, right? Some of the highest uh, German German highest nobility was killed. Um, it caused major unrest in naturally in Germany first of all, but also in Italy. So at this point, like it, it, it makes you feel bad about it because you realize that they had basically managed to, to conquer all, all of southern Italy. Um, and and if that control had been maintained through, through a direct occupation and consolidation, history would have been completely different. There may have not been that the Kingdom of Sicily, the Norman advent, uh, the Byzantines would have not reconquered wide areas of the south in the following time. So the, uh, the, the German defeat at Cape Colonna was of... Um, disturbing proportions and there is also an incident where um, basically Otto escaped death barely because there was um, a Byzantine fleet um, just near to the coast where the battle had taken place and he was taken on board and considered the guy was Holy Roman Emperor and had married a Byzantine princess so the Byzantines that naturally were pretty, you know, upset for, from the fact that, that uh, the the Ottonians had gained so much power in southern Italy were like treating him well on on board. But Otto understood that they basically wanted to kidnap and deport him to Constantinople as a as a hostage, right? Just imagine taking the Holy Roman Emperor as a whole stage to Constantinople, what, what kind of political leverage he would have had in the West. So at that point, Otto II threw himself overboard and reached the coast at some other point in uh, by by swimming. Naturally, you know, uh, this was coastal navigation at the time, so it was not that far away, but just for telling you what kind of picture here and the, the magnitude of the disaster of Cotrona really was. Um, after the, the defeat against the Saracens, Otto II and Teofano uh, had no other choice but to retreat with their few remaining troops to first to Salerno, then to Capua, and eventually Rome. Um, this military defeat um, had um, disrupted the political situation. Um, uh, Otto had to return to northern Italy, first of all, because there, again, there were some agitations uh, that wanted still the emperor kind of up, because as long as the emperor was there, naturally, he had more leverage on tax collection, all this stuff, so naturally the the, the communities exploited the, the thing to, to keep him out. Um, so in order to save the savable Otto, carry out the same usual Ottonian policy. He issued a number of important diplomas, which um, were actually an important political achievement as such, because they managed to to actually create a compromise. The local communities were not just 
hostile by default, as we've seen. They just wanted their own autonomies, they wanted to be considered. Um, and especially in May 983, during an assembly of um, his uh, Otto's most powerful nobles in Verona, I made a video about medieval Verona if you're interested for the historical regions series. The emperor arranged for his three year old son to be elected king as Otto III, which would happen. Um, in this assembly in, in Verona, there was also an important uh, matter dealt with regarding the city of Venice which had always remained mm, a frontier uh, center, as you know, between the Italic Kingdom and the Byzantine Empire. Um, there had been some agreements in the time of Charlemagne that had brought Venice to acquiesce to some sort of... Uh, to, to the recognition of some sort of Carolingian arbitrate to, to decide her... Um, you know, some, to interfere at least in, in her internal matters and an opportunity, first of all, for the city to, to have some powerful to, um, ruler that they could um, turn to in case the Byzantines became too oppressive. Naturally, nobody had ever managed to occupy Venice. Venice was connected via sea with Constantinople, but the local government was becoming ever more uh, compact, seafaring, so also the Byzantines basically already at this point didn't have any real control uh, on the city if not for the traditional kind of trade rights that uh, the Italians enjoyed uh, in, in the capital and that, that would keep uh, increasing in fact over time. Um, Venice at this point was uh, as we've just said experiencing a tumultuous growth for which the Venetian um, noble clans were struggling to um, to 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 dominate right there was already a doge a dux right that was part of the titles that the byzantines had been using um, themselves at a point as a military commander properly so venice as a frontier area coping with again just being next door to, to the carolingians coping with slavic piracy etc was meant to, to become. Again, Venetian aggression, uh, expansion at this point was one of the single most radically aggressive phenomena in the entire history of mankind. I mean, the Venetians basically took out everyone they found in, in, their, in their way. Um, they, uh, there is a reason why they would remain essentially the, um, you know, the major naval power until the, uh, the second modern age. And th this, um, this, this mentality was, was naturally also the product of an internal struggle. And especially at this point that had brought uh, the attention of Otto II, the violent clashes between the Candiano and Morosini clans, um, which were disrupting, naturally, trade, the stability of the city. So the Ottonians had great part, naturally, of the Po River traffic leading to Central Europe, the Salt, uh, all this being controlled by the Venetians, and these internal struggles were disrupting such trade, um, so they had to intervene. And Otto II managed to negotiate a lasting peace between the two Venetian uh, clans, um, thus showing again that uh, it was the Ottonians that got it in in the region, right? Uh, Authoritatively speaking, and the Byzantines were ever more distant in that in that game. Uh, in spite even of of the defeat at Cape Colon the year the year before, um, this was an important success. Except um, Otto II died uh, suddenly in Rome at the end of 983, and this opened to the minority of his son Otto III. Um, so we will see the latter uh, in another in another video because we already discussed him at some point, but. Uh, everything is better um, deepened. Uh, what can we say about Otto's the second policy? Well, in about 
say also the first ones in a sense because there is especially a, a comparison one could draw with the Italic Kings of the first half of the 10th century that uh, had um, never been able to have a regional scale uh, originally scaled power right there were essentially these various chunks Spoleto, Tuscany um, Verona the the Ivra and so on, they, they had all a kind of provincial power. They at some point managed to be recognized kings of Italy crowned in Pavia, and at some point even rec being recognized emperors. They were emperors, right? They just went to Rome um, to be recognized, and they count in the chronology, in fact, of the Holy Roman Empire as rulers. The point is that they in spite of these crownings, they had never been able to actually dislodge each other. Um, the Po Valley had never been unified. The, the rest of Italy had, uh, central Italy, say, it had not been unified. So in spite of all the leverage that they had sometimes, the, the Spoleto Dukes on Rome and the Papacy and, I don't know, the, the Mar uh, Keyses of, of Verona and of of Ivrea could, could monopolize, let's say, at least Pavia and the, the 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 italic capital and so on. It was there had never been kind of a full control of this. So when the Ottonians come, the, the thing changes because it's literally a regional scale invasion. There is a basically a, a sole power recognized. There aren't, um, as we've seen, particular problems. This kind of revolts in or at least secessions, at least stone oppositions and so on. This would happen at the time of Otto III in Henry II, especially. Um, and we will see it uh, at another time. But what strikes uh, in this situation is that not only Otto I and Otto II ruled uh, time allowing uh, their, their physical presence south of the Alps uh, in the kingdom, but Essentially, the system that they implanted by co-opting the local elites brought to essentially a continuous functionality of the royal institutions throughout the even the uh, the moments of absence of the kings slash emperors in the peninsula. This is remarkable, really. Again, this is basically together with parts of Otto the Third's reign. The moment, uh, the, the moment of greatest control and stability of the Germanic rulers on the Italian peninsula, right? The peak, right? It's not to say that later they would be as powerful in absolute terms, but compared to what would develop in Italy later, so as a resistance, as you know, there was never the fact of control, um, uh, except here we're talking the Italic kingdom, right? The kingdom of Sicily is another thing; was not part of the empire. It counts in another way. Um, it was a feudal monarchy. Later, in the Salic Kingdom would become a, a communal system. So it's a completely different thing, and we will talk about those chapters uh, separate. Even though, of course, the, the broader imperial policy depended heavily on the control on such uh, southern kingdoms. Um, um, how can we explain this stability? Well, in part, we, we, we did it throughout this video. However, the main point being, again, the, the nature of this power. You had this major, big country. So you have Germany, that is also technically larger than today's Germany, um, because there is also an expansion ever more towards the, uh, not just the east, but the west. There is also Burgundy in part then Italy, which is also pretty big, as far as the south, as we've seen, so with the capacity even to wage war beyond the actual boundaries of the Italic Kingdom. So you have two big complex regions that, or more actually, that um, were not, say, were capable altogether to provide enough surplus say, the necessary surplus for a single ruler to wage war in significant areas, the, uh, the Slavic frontier, the, 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 
the southern frontier without resulting too oppressive, right? The more you have, it's as if, again, the Ottonians had been floating over the seas, huge seas of forces that were already kind of developing on their own. The German princes, uh, the Italian uh, um, ones, um, the... Uh, generally speaking, they were f kind of recompacting their own world. And there was enough surplus, enough pacification, especially after the second invasions, right? The end of... The, this is one of the most significant aspects of it, naturally, that this was possible, this reunification also of Italy and Germany, after the defeat of the Magyars, after... 955, the Magyars basically stop any... Uh, after generations where this had happened almost every year, any expedition to the West. They try a bit against the Byzantines, they see in the Balkans, they see it doesn't work, and they decide to settle down also, kind of entering the spiritual orbit of Rome and of the Empire. Right, So this is crucial, because lots of resources were freed, from this constant Magyar harassment. And the responsible of this are the Saxon arms, right? At least, you know, the uh, Otto's military fort in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, thanks to which, you know, he's able to invade Italy to bring in more resources also for Germany, but still not fundamentally oppressing the Italian subjects uh, to the point of causing revolts uh, or disintegrations or, or other dramatic problems, right? This is particularly important. The public institutions of the Italic Kingdom go on working automatically, even without the Emperor during this period, and they work uh, successfully, also f for the sake of imperial policy. In 984, um, when the uh, that uh, Otto III was only three years old, um, the efforts made by Duke Henry of Bavaria to oppose Theophanus' regency, because this was an, a Byzantine empress. The son was was a minor, so what the hell? It wasn't you couldn't. Uh, the, the, she was not an empress. You see, the, the title of emperor is only for males. Females, by definition, cannot rule. They cannot do that, metaphysically speaking, because there are very specific reasons why a woman cannot rule in, in tradition. Um, um, and um, therefore, some German princes say, oh, now, especially this other Ottonian branch of Bavaria, saying, okay, now we rebel. But not even that worked, because they knew that at the end of the day, the rest of Germany kind of was kind of fine with that, because, again, there is a guy who is a minor, why do we take over the, you know, why, why do we create other trouble here? Let's simply stay each other in, in our own duchy and let's make things work. That's the same with the Italians reason, like, right? They didn't have any reason to make mess. There wasn't any greater prospect to say to, to go out or to break this order. There wasn't any single ruler that was as powerful to, to aggress another for good. As we've seen, this hadn't worked in Italy, it hadn't worked in Germany. The same Ottonians had risen to power mostly with the Saxon Franconian base, but had been brought to power by the other Germans, not really just because they were stronger than everybody else. And, and this was the sap of the cooperation, the cohesion, the stability we're talking about. There was a reason why it was good to maintain this order. Um, Teofano remained in Germany. Um, the real regent of Italy was Adelaide, interestingly enough, she, she was old, as you understand, by that point, but she was very good um, at governing, and she received the support of um, a few absolutely loyal uh, Italian magnates, such as, for example, the Margrave uh, Hugh of Tuscany, so the connection with the Canossa there had remained strong. Um, while southern Italy, so beyond the confines of the Italic Kingdom, uh, was lost, yes, but at least was not part of a previously held territory, Rome was basically now in the hands of the Crescenzi that had, as we've seen, had uh, by this point been fundamentally anti-Ottonian, anti uh, anti not, not anti-imperial even per se, right? This were a 
powerful noble family there are still structures built in these years exactly still visible displaying the the wealth uh, of, of the clan uh, in the eternal city but even there again the papacy was with the empire and vice versa so again it was the city of rome wanted to be left alone but they were okay with this international play that they weren't creating problems in the order as well and this is the reason why such stability uh, manifested herself and why such um, uh, such order was successfully maintained after all and this was a I would say a, a positive phase right you, you look at a few moments in history in which you have a real kind of growth of stability of some kind of order some sort where there is a demographic increase an economic increase and fundamentally you just have that going um, things naturally would change because as soon as surplus enough surplus accumulates there are some powers that tend to, to take over but it, that is also actually a if you look at it in perspective um, happening in moments of expansion so in moments of civilizational development of 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 growth right of increased power and beyond so these are all very important dynamics that you have to take to account uh, in the meanwhile so we will talk uh, in other videos about other uh, the rest of the Ottonian rule in Italy and looking at various other things uh, concerning the topic for today I stop it here however I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time Bye.